Thank you, sir, for agreeing to do this interview, the young reporter began kissing my butt. Since you are retiring as CEO of one of the region's largest employers, our newspaper wants to feature you in an article in Sunday's edition. I understand that. I'm just afraid your readers won't have anything to be interested in, I replied. We are successful because we produce a superior product at a competitive price. I really don't think this is a corporate secret. Most successful companies follow this formula. What I was looking for was human interest, sir the guy replied. I want to know things like how long it took you to get to the top of the company. Were you ever discouraged? How long have you been with Norris Enterprises? Have you started at the bottom and worked your way up through the ranks? Was there some turning point in your career that you can point to as the day you realized you were going to be the leader of the company, or did it happen gradually? The visionary guy asked the question. You're serious, aren't you? I think you are too young to remember the business climate in 2009. It was a very difficult period, as you may have read in some history books. You may think that ten years ago, dinosaurs walked the planet, I reflected. You will learn that time has a way of slipping away. In fact, I vividly remember the day I realized I was destined to succeed in this company as if it were yesterday, not ten years ago. The story will not be what you expect, so just sit back and I'll try to reconstruct the events as I remember them. You have a few minutes, don't you? I asked, leaning back in my chair and reflecting on that spring day so long ago. I was awakened by the ringing of my cell phone. By the time I found the spot where I had dropped my pants on the floor the night before, the ringing had already stopped. A quick glance at the cell phone showed that I had missed seven calls. I fell asleep after Jay Leno's monologue, host of the late night show. The clock on the nightstand showed that it was now just a few minutes after six in the morning. Something must have happened to get so many calls between midnight and six in the morning. The last call was from my boss's home phone. I dialed the number and waited for an answer. Hello, Frank. An excited Marge Larson answered. I'm glad you called back. There's hell waiting for you here. You'd better get home as soon as possible. My husband, your wife, and your wife's brother-in-law are in the hospital. They'll be fine, so don't worry about them too much, but... You need to get back here and help me clean up all the crap that came through the proverbial fan. What the hell are you talking about, Marge? I demanded an answer. Why are there so many people in the hospital? Was it an accident or an explosion? What happened? I so wish the reason was so mundane, Frank. I have to go to the hospital, then visit my lawyer and finally get to the plant and find out what the hell is going on. I wish I had been paying more attention to business lately. Roberta knows the situation well enough, Marge. Let her handle the business while you focus on more pressing matters, I suggested, while my mind tried to put the information Marge had revealed to me in order. Ah, yes, Roberta. I forgot to mention that she's in jail. I gotta go, Frank. Try to get your ass back here as soon as possible. I need you here. Marge urged me to end the conversation. I pulled out of the motel and pointed the car north on Route 81. As I drove, I tried to make a few phone calls to find out what was going on at home. My wife and sister-in-law did not answer the phone. My wife's parents reported nothing except that my wife and their other son-in-law were in the hospital. Both of my children lived in Washington, D.C., and knew no more than I did, if at all. I returned to my hometown almost three hours later with no more information about the situation. I entered the hospital at nine in the morning and went straight to the front desk. I soon learned that my wife had suffered a broken nose and a concussion. She was now under observation, whatever that meant. She smiled weakly as I was escorted into her room. Frank, this is all a huge mistake, darling. You have to believe me, she began. Well, this is really good news, Tessa, I replied sarcastically. I think the rainbow circles on your face and the fact that you were unconscious for half an hour or so just fooled the medical staff. They mistakenly thought something was wrong with you. If it's a mistake, we can get a big settlement for negligence. Let's go home. No, Frank, it wasn't a mistake. I have a concussion and a broken nose. I'll have to have surgery when the swelling goes down. The mistake was what happened to Jeff, she said, and then added slowly, and Jack. That explains it so well, Tessa, I admitted. You're totally screwed because of a mistake, as you put it, involving my boss and your sister's husband. Can you anticipate all the questions I might have, answer them, and keep us from doing it the hard way? I can anticipate some of the things you might wonder about, Frank. 
but I'm still recovering from a concussion, and I don't think it would be a good idea to say too much right now. I'll feel better soon, and then we can talk things over, okay? I can see that all that time at the law firm is paying off, Tessa, I snapped back. You just rest. And while you're resting, maybe you can come up with some story that will explain everything to my satisfaction and maybe show that you're the helpless victim of some conspiracy. I was too angry to stay in the same room with my wife. I had already learned that she, my boss, and her sister's husband had been taken from my house by ambulance the previous evening. Add to that the fact that my immediate boss at work, Roberta, had been arrested and taken to jail at the same time, and also from my house and it gave me a sense of anxiety and worry that I couldn't shake off. Am I being paranoid for worrying about such trivial things? And then she tells me she's too weak to tell me what the hell was going on last night at my house. As I was walking out of the hospital into the lobby, I was stopped by a man in a suit. He handed me some kind of ID with a bunch of fine print that I couldn't read without my glasses. Despite being a bit far-sighted, I could easily tell this guy was some kind of police officer. Things were getting more interesting by the minute. Mr. Barker? He began his interrogation. Can I ask you a few questions? You have a little time, don't you? You can't take your wife home for a few more hours, can you? By almost any definition you just did, I replied with irritation. Is that it? Or is there more to it? He stared at me for a few seconds, mulling over my abrupt answer. Finally, he shrugged and continued. I'm trying to piece together what happened last night at your house. There are several versions of events, but they all point to you being the central force in this perfect storm. Where were you last night? I was in Harrisburg. I met with a client and then had dinner with him. I'm staying at the Motel 8 near Hershey, and I left this morning, just after 6 o'clock this morning. I was sent there on orders from my boss, Jack Larson, through my immediate supervisor, Roberta Peters. Since they were two of the clusterfucks you've already interrogated, you should have known that. Unless, of course, they were in a truthful mood, I added sarcastically. They both told me you were sent to Harrisburg, the detective admitted. It's a little more complicated than that. Miss Peters said you called from Harrisburg and asked for a package to be delivered to your home last night. Her complicity was a direct result of her responding to your request. That is utter nonsense, I stated categorically. I didn't call her, I didn't talk to her, and I didn't know that she came to my house for any reason. I called my boss's house last night and spoke to Mrs. Larson. I asked her to let me talk to her husband, but she told me he was out of town. He had gone fishing in upstate New York and would be back late the next evening. Mrs. Larson asked me if this was important. Since her family actually owns the business, I didn't see fit to keep her in the dark about anything, so I explained my dilemma. I had bought an expensive pearl necklace for my wife's birthday and foolishly left it in the desk in my office. It bothered me both that I had left it there and that my wife wouldn't get it for her birthday, which was today. I told Marge that I was going to ask Jack, my boss, if he could drop the present off at my house. My wife was going to leave to visit her elderly grandmother in a nursing home in New Jersey. She was going to stay at a motel nearby and return home this morning. I was hoping the necklace would be at the house so I could call her and ask her to try it on. Then she'll praise me for being a very caring and loving husband, even if I have to be away on business on her birthday, I reasoned. Miss Peters pretty much told me the same version, only she claims that you knew Mrs. Larson would call her and ask her to do this assignment because her husband was out of state fishing. She claims you set her up, the detective finished. Set her up for what? I demanded an answer. I called my boss to ask him to do me a personal favor. I had no idea Roberta would be involved. I still have no idea what the hell happened. Why are you asking me these questions? Why is she under arrest? What the hell happened in my house last night? Did you ask Jeff Rogers to go to your house to let Miss Peters in? The flatfoot cop continued, proving he has the temperament and brains of a bulldog. Where the hell do you get this shit from? I asked in bewilderment. I called my wife's sister, June, and told her she might get a call from my boss. That was before I talked to his wife and found out he was out of town. I asked her if she could drive over with the spare key to our house that she kept, meet my boss there, and let him in. It was a pretty simple request. Looks like it, said the bloody idiot, a detective who looked more like Charlie Chan's number two son than a modern policeman. Why don't you tell me what's going on? How did my wife or any of these other cluster fuckers end up in the hospital? 
Why was Roberta arrested? Who was kicked off American Idol, an American television singing competition series this week? I demanded. All I can tell you at this point is that Lil Rounds is toast, admitted the departing lawman, heading for a fresh box of donuts just delivered by a patrolman. Son of a bitch, I growled back at the detective. I thought she was going to win this whole case. I couldn't think of anything else to do, so I headed home. I was terribly angry at my wife for using her evasive lawyer language when I asked her what had happened. I didn't much care for Jeff, my former brother-in-law, and my douchey boss, Jack. The former had been a pain in my ass ever since my sister-in-law brought his sorry ass home from college about 15 years ago. He was a sophomore guard on a Penn State team that nearly lost in the Orange Bowl. Somehow, that elevated him to hero status in that orphanage my wife called her family home. The fact that he never finished university and couldn't get a steady job didn't matter. He was a fucking nittany lion. My boss was another asshole. I repeatedly demonstrated my knowledge of the business and my value to the company. Without bragging, I knew more about Norris Enterprises than he and Roberta combined. The only downside to my employment record was that I was a man. So Jack, my jerk boss, promoted Roberta to me. This was based on her one quality. She fucked like a mink. I suppose it was an affirmative action since she never told him. No. Now Roberta was in jail and the other suspects were in the hospital. I was unable to find out the cause other than Tessa had a concussion and a broken nose. The extent or causes of the other two's injuries were somehow a secret. I didn't even know why Roberta had been arrested. The idea that they were somehow blaming it on me was ridiculous. The house looked like a bomb had gone off in it. The front door was broken out and pinned shut with some crooked nails. I walked over to the door to the kitchen and stepped inside. The first thing I noticed was a trail of blood coming down the stairs. Walking down it, I found more blood on my leather couch. It was similar in consistency to liver and was a very bright crimson color. I decided, fuck it, and walked up the stairs, trying not to step on the blood trail. It became almost impossible when I entered my bedroom. Blood was everywhere. It covered the floor and the bed was splattered haphazardly on the walls and furniture. And then I saw a wrapped box containing a pearl necklace in the corner of the room by the closet. I quickly picked it up and opened it. I determined that the necklace was intact and undamaged. I slipped it into my pocket. I studied the scene of the massacre but couldn't make sense of it, either in my head or in the tales of the mess. I realized I should have watched more crime shows and less reality TV. I left the house as I found it and headed for the office. Tessa had been involved in the appearance of the blood, so she could have cleaned it up or arranged for it to be cleaned up. I had a bad feeling about the whole situation. There was less blood in the damn okay corral than there was in my bedroom. Things like that rarely happened when I was sitting in bed reading a novel. Marge was in the office when I arrived. It was obvious there was a heightened state of anxiety. I guess when your bosses are hospitalized or imprisoned, it, it creates a certain amount of tension. Frank, Marge Larson called out from her husband's office, inviting me to join her. I'm glad you're back so soon. Were you at the hospital? Actually, yes, Marge, I admitted as I entered the room and closed the door. My wife bullied me for a couple minutes, and then some genius from the police department questioned me. Did you tell him anything? Marge asked. Now I was really feeling out of my depth. What kind of question was that? What the hell could I have told him? Yes, Marge. I told him where to find Jimmy Hoffa, Elvis, and Sasquatch. I didn't want to, but the guy turned out to be so smart and got it all out of me. What the hell can I tell him if I have no idea what the hell is going on? I protested vehemently. How did you explain that your brother-in-law was at your house? You told me your wife's sister would be there to let me in. I relayed that information to Roberta. How did you get Jeff to come to your house instead of June? It was a stroke of genius, she laughed. Have you ever participated in a conversation when you have no idea what's going on? You understand every word that is being used, but altogether they don't seem to make any sense? Then you wonder if maybe you have brain damage or are in a stupor. I felt exactly the same way. What the hell are you talking about, Marge? I asked into the void. Marge stared at me for a few seconds and then seemed to suddenly make a brilliant observation. My God, Frank, you didn't know anything, did you? A puzzled Marge asked rhetorically. You really wanted Tessa to get that present for her birthday. 
You didn't know about Jeff and had no idea that he was the one who let Roberta into your house. This is priceless. I seem to be in the dark, Marge, but I expect you to bring me up to speed and pretty darn quickly. These stupid references to something and incomprehensible statements just piss me off. Tell me what the fuck is going on. I don't have a lot of time. I told the hospital I'd be back at one o'clock to pick up Tessa and bring her home. Just lay it all out and tell me in plain English so I understand. Let me start by saying that you really don't want to take Tessa home. She has a broken nose and a concussion because Jeff punched her in the face, Marge said. Don't turn this into a game, Marge, I warned. You can guess that I want to know why he hit her and why I shouldn't take her. Jeff hit her in a fit of jealousy when he saw her riding my husband cowboy style. It was more than he could handle, so he hit her hard and then started hitting Jack. He did a hell of a job on Jack's balls and cock, not to mention breaking his jaw and knocking out almost all of his teeth. Tessa was riding Jack. Jeff got mad and jumped Jack for me. We were never that close, but I had him to thank for that. Wow, that's a lot to swallow at once, Marge. Jack and Tessa were playing hide the sausage. Jeff caught them and spanked Jack for me. I owe that jerk a lot. I'm ashamed of all the times I made fun of him, I admitted. No, Frank, you're not, Marge exclaimed. Jeff beat up Jack because he was jealous. He'd had your wife for years and was furious when he found out she'd been unfaithful to him. I staggered and slumped back in my chair. Jeff and Jack had both fucked Tessa. How could I have missed that? It was obvious that if Marge was right, I wasn't going to be in a hurry to get Tessa out of the hospital. Why was Jeff himself hospitalized? Let me see if I got this right, Marge. Jeff came to my house to tell Roberta about my gift for Tessa. He and Roberta assumed that Tessa and Jack were out of town and the house would be empty. They somehow caught Tessa riding Jack. Jeff screwed Tessa because he thought she was his exclusive whore. Then he worked Jack over for having his whore. Are we sure now? I asked. I think you've got it right now, Frank, Marge agreed. One little problem. Boss lady number one forgot that Jeff's in the hospital, too. You think Jeff beat himself unconscious even though it didn't take much at all, I added in my best Charlie Chan imitation, which wasn't very good. Marge actually grinned as she replied, Roberta stabbed Jeff in the femoral artery. He was bleeding like a hunted hog. The police arrived just as she shot him and ended up breaking down your front door. By then, Jeff was dragging his ass down the stairs and was covered in blood, shitting all over your leather couch. I see, I replied, unable to think of anything more witty. Are you going to tell me that Tessa played with Roberta, too? That's so wrong. No, not Tessa, Marge explained. Roberta and Jack had been belly bumping for about a year now. When she saw Jeff give her boss and lover such a thorough ass kicking, she pulled a gun out of her coat pocket and shot Jeff. She was arrested for multiple firearms violations and for shooting the asshole. It seems to me, Marge, that you're pretty well informed about this whole fiasco. You were under the bed or maybe... Nothing would surprise me now. Hardly, Marge grinned. I had a frequent detective following Jack around for the last few weeks. He was outside your house listening through a device he had hidden in Jack's pants. He was the one who called the cops when he heard Jeff going crazy. If you had a man watching Jack, you had to know that he was already at my house and had Tess when you sent Roberta there to deliver the necklace. Did it ever occur to you that there might be a problem? Hell, Roberta never hid the fact that she had a gun. Everybody knew about it, I practically yelled at Marge. Actually, Frank, it did occur to me that this Annie Oakley might pull out her old pig's foot and do some frontier justice. Marge smiled. I just didn't expect your brother-in-law to be there. I didn't realize he had Tessa, too. I thought June would let Roberta in and be a reliable witness to what was going on. Damn it, Marge. Tessa and Jack could have been shot by Roberta, I noted excitedly. Did you ever think of that? Well, of course I did. I knew it was possible. I thought you knew everything and were trying to set me up to catch Jack and Tessa. I just set Roberta up to, as they say, protect the innocent. The fact that Jeff, who let Roberta in, was also Tessa's lover, and proceeded to beat the crap out of both of them, was just the savory gravy. I thought you planned that one somehow, too. Well, now Jack and Roberta are out of business and you have a company to run. Marge, hadn't you thought of that? Or were you so out for revenge that you were willing to destroy the company your father had built from scratch? I demanded an answer. Again, Frank, I thought about it. You and I both know you're more oblivious than those two idiots will ever know about running this company. 
I thought you might like Jack's position and his office, with double the salary. And you'll also get a first-class pussy that Jack will never be allowed to service again, if you heard me right, Marge cooed. I almost blew it when I stupidly asked, do you mean Roberta or Tessa?